Good evening, and, and thank you very much for coming. It's a, a pleasure to be here again. Just see if I can get my... Ah, it works. I want to talk about, about big data and some of the implications of, of big data, and, and then about anonymization and, and some of the implications of anonymization. Big data is one of the government's eight great technologies, the technologies that the Chancellor says the UK can take a lead in and make a lot of, of profit and business and jobs from. Uh, in fact, there are nine eight great technologies because they forgot quantum uh, and so they now talk about eight great technologies plus one. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of data around. Um, 2,500 million gigabytes a day created, according to IBM. Uh, and again, IBM is the source of, of the information that 90% of all the world's data was created in the last two years. That's the pace at which we're creating new data. There's, there's a lot of it about. And big data is characterized by very high volume of, of data, as we've just seen, by a, a great variety of data types. Uh, data comes in in text form, structured, unstructured. It, it's video, it's pictures, it's sound. It's machine-based data streamed out of aeroplane engines, for example, and, and processed by companies to uh, enable them to do maintenance predictions on, on pieces of equipment. There is huge variety of data, and a lot of it is processed at very high velocity. So these three Vs are quite often used. Sometimes other Vs are added in just for, for sport. Um, to, to define what, what is meant by big data. An uh, example of, of the high volume, and there, there are 400 million tweets a day, and some organisations buy access to the, to the Twitter firehose, as it's called, and actually process those 400 million tweets a day. Uh, they can either take them in a filtered form, selected on various criteria, or... If they're the security services or law enforcement or, or some of the hedge funds, they may actually take the full fire hose and process them at that kind of pace, looking for, for sentiment analysis, looking to see whether they can predict the way the market's going to move a few milliseconds ahead of their, their competitors. Some, some of the big data is not personal data, and I'm, I'm not that interested in talking about that tonight. It's the personal data that, that I think is the really interesting stuff. Um, the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, produces about three, 30 million gigabytes a year of data. None of that's about, about people. No, no personal, um, no privacy implications in any of that. But a lot of data is personal in, in ways that uh, are rather unexpected and we're all carrying tracking devices around, mobile telephones, uh, which are recording uh, where the phone has, has been and for how long, um, what calls have been made and received, what texts have been sent and received and so on. And, and we leave a big data trail whenever we do anything. A lot of the data, a lot of big data is just records of what people have been doing one way or another. Oyster card records showing all the journeys that have been made using Oyster cards. Um, credit card data, you know, 70 items of, of data approximately sent every time a credit card's used. And if it's an online purchase, much more information than that because the the analytics on the website will, will say um, what you were searching for when you arrived at the website, where you came from, uh, what pages you looked at, how long you stayed on, on the website, what ads were displayed to you, whether you clicked on any of them, um, how long you stayed on individual pages, which pages you went back to, and finally what, what um, websites you, you left to. So there's a, a lot of data collected in, in that form. And as we'll see in my next lecture in, in October, quite a lot of that is processed in, in ways that um, we, we might not be that comfortable with. I, for example, it may very well affect the price that you're charged for something when you're buying online. 
Um, you may not get the same, the same price presented to you as somebody else if, for example, you've, you've shown that you've done your research and come back to this particular website. Phone metadata, the, the kind of information that phone companies collect in order to be able to run their businesses. Um, there was a, an experiment carried out at, at Stanford University, and, and I've taken this out of a, a wonderful book called, called Data and Goliath by, by Bruce, Bruce Schneier, not Schneider, as I ignorantly put on the slide, um, who is, is a great guy and, and writes a lot in the security area. And, and if you're interested in, in that area, then subscribe to his um, regular newsletter. Uh, and it's, it's well worth getting hold of. It only comes out about once a fortnight or something, but it's, al it's always interesting. It's called Cryptogram. The, in this experiment, they got, they got 500 volunteers to, to sign up um, and, and to have their, their metadata collected. And, and this is what happened. I mean, one of them contacted a home improvement shop, a locksmith, a hydroponics dealer, and a head shop. One called a hospital, a medical lab, a pharmacy, and then there were several short calls to a, a monitoring hotline for a heart monitor. Uh, one called her sister and had, had a very long conversation and then called an abortion clinic and two weeks later called again a few times and, and then a final call a month later. Just out of the metadata, we can see a cannabis grower, a heart patient and an abortion. Just out of the metadata. This is metadata, this is not content. It's very revealing. Um, some, some security experts will say that actually the metadata is more revealing than the content, uh, partly because it's, so much, it's structured data. It's much easier to process automatically. Who ought to have access to that? If, if you've got strong views on that, then please tell your MP what your strong views are, because the regulatory powers bill that has gone through the commons in, in the last couple of weeks and which will be going into the Lords where it will get amended a lot and then go back to, to the commons, uh, has, has a lot to say about who has access to this sort of metadata. And you, you may be discomforted by some of the, uh, the people who, who have access to that. And, and again, that's a, a topic we'll come back to in, in a later uh, lecture uh, during this calendar year. If you compare, and this is just data from one person's records, if you start matching the data from several people, you know which phones are travelling together because you know where they are and you know when they're there, so you know who's meeting. Um, if they're meeting on a regular basis, um, staying overnight, chances are they're sleeping together. Uh, if, if they're meeting um, in hotel middle of the afternoon uh, on, on an intermittent but fairly regular basis, you can, you can perhaps infer some things about what's happening there. Uh, you, can, you can look at the trends, the, the differences in, in the people that people are meeting. You can see who's going to political rallies or churches or, or uh, who's going to... Um, who's following somebody around and that's a, a as Edward Snowden has revealed that's a standard technique that's used um, the security services track the phones that are used by their own operatives but they also uh, carry out searches routinely to see what other phones are traveling with those phones because chances are that that means somebody's following one of their operatives around and they need to know about it so when people say that metadata is not that important. Um, quote back to them what the CIA have, have gone on record to say, which is, we, we kill people on metadata. And of course they do, that's how they target the drones. Companies collect a lot of data, as we've seen. Um, big, big numbers of transactions, 128 billion transactions just on Visa uh, in, in last year. Um, Law student Max Schrems, an Austrian law student, asked Facebook for all the data that they had on him. And, and they resisted for a while, but he took them to court and forced them to send him the data. And they sent him a CD that contained this 1,200-page PDF. Uh, his entire news feed, every ad that he'd, he'd ever been shown, 
uh, a vast amount of information collected by, by Facebook just on, on that one person. Um, phone companies keep text messages uh, sometimes for a very long time. The, the relationship between companies and, and consumers, customers, citizens, has changed radically as a result of the, the cyber-enabled world that we live in. Um, and that issue about what data companies should have, what they should be able to do with it, and, and um, what, what you can do as individuals to, to try to retain more control over that data is a, a topic that, as I say, we'll, we'll come back to later this year. The law has, has some things to say. This is, is the um, Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, Article 12. Um, and this is the basis, of course, for the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, for the, for the um, various other conventions on human rights that, that exist around the world, for lots of treaty obligations. So there are about 20 or 30 different treaties that actually contain essentially the same words. It is universally accepted that there is a legal commitment, a legal requirement to preserve people's privacy. But people say, yes, but you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. And I, I want to explain just briefly why that's, that's unthinking, it's ignorant, and it's callous, and it's wrong. People should not say that, and yet politicians do it whenever they're trying to explain that it's quite all right that they've got access to your personal data or that they're giving it to somebody else. Most, most of us actually do choose to control our privacy. We, we draw curtains. Um, we would feel, even though we've got a tracking device in our pockets, we'd feel pretty uncomfortable about having streaming video in, in our bedrooms or in the bathroom. Uh, and, and when people are found installing video cameras in, into private places, they quite rightly get prosecuted for breach of privacy and, and people feel violated. There is a human sense in which privacy is at the root of human dignity. This is, this is liberty and, and, and privacy.org's view of, of, um, of the role of privacy in society. It is, it is very important to, to maintain human dignity and the right relations between people. That's all of us. But there's a, a significant number of people who, who are seriously at risk if their privacy is violated. And I've listed just, just a few of them. Um, people who, who've suffered serious trauma in the past can be deeply, deeply undermined if, if the, the details of, of the fact that they were, were raped or abused as a child becomes public knowledge or, or known to their colleagues at work. E even you know, people who've got a diagnosis of a serious illness may not wish to share it with casual acquaintances or, or work colleagues. It may be something they feel is very private to themselves. People who are escaping abusive relationships may be at serious threat if their location is, is revealed to the abuser who, who may be working very hard to try to track them down. Um, there's a lot of discrimination in the world. Things that are, that are nobody's fault, characteristics, uh, mental illnesses that people may have suffered cause people to discriminate against them if this becomes widely known. There have been a, a number of cases where people's HIV status has caused them to, to lose their jobs, for example, quite unnecessarily and wrongly. And, and HIV status is a specially protected characteristic under the law. It, it, it is regarded as extremely private. Uh, people adopting children. Um, children are taken into care because they have been abused almost always. And the birth families, the relations of, of the original birth parents, quite often feel very badly about the fact that the children have been, been taken into care and then adopted and try to tr track them down and, and may even attempt uh, to kidnap them. And, and therefore, it's very important to adoptive parents to be able to maintain privacy and, and to maintain secrecy of, of their identity when they choose to do so, and for as long as they choose to do so. There's a lot of serious risks. Social workers, prison officers, 
undercover workers in the security industry, lots of people whose jobs uh, either require them or give them the ability to uh, actually project a, a different identity. And, and it's important that that isn't violated because they may be at serious risk. So just before you tag somebody's photograph on social media, just, just think about the risk you may be exposing them and, and their family to at some point, either now or in the future. And, and just make sure you really want to do that. Big data is valuable. Facebook's worth 333 billion. Uh, we saw LinkedIn bought for, for um, $26 billion by Microsoft just yesterday. Um, that values each active user on LinkedIn at $65. Now, LinkedIn hasn't been making $65 out of each active user. LinkedIn's been losing money. Uh, so Microsoft, are, are, if you're an active user on LinkedIn, my, Microsoft have got to get their money back somehow. Uh, so you can expect that they will attempt to monetize the fact that they have now bought all that, that personal data. And, you know, it's an entirely legitimate commercial transaction. It will be interesting to see how it, how it pans out. But most of the value of these, these extremely valuable internet companies comes from the personal data that they hold. They have virtually no other assets. And as I say, we'll, we'll come back to whether you're getting full value out of your personal data and what you may be able to do about it you know, on the 18th of October. Data has been described as the new oil. It's, it's a resource that, that can be mined and um, processed, turned from crude data into refined data, and then whole industries can be founded on it. And, and we're seeing that increasingly. And the, the driverless car industry is, is very heavily dependent on, on big data of all sorts, for example. And, and that's just one new technology which most uh, developed countries are starting to invest in in a significant way. And because I'm, I'm going to continue to, to say some things about the privacy implications of, of processing big data, I, I just I don't want to give the wrong impression. Big data analysis is very important. It really is valuable, not, not just to big companies like Facebook and Microsoft, but to, to society, to us. The, the ability to, to process very large amounts of medical data, for example, is, is at the root of being able to discover um, the causes of illnesses and, and new cures for illnesses. The, the ability to be able to mine prescribing data across the country has already discovered anomalies in, in the way in which doctors are prescribing antibiotics that have enabled local areas to intervene and to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are being prescribed in some areas unnecessarily uh, and, and thereby to extend the life of these antibiotics which are are gradually becoming less and less effective because of over-prescribing. Over Big data mining for, for I'm just mining the phone data for law enforcement reasons, for example, is, is enormously important to the police. Uh, lots of crimes are, are detected very, and, and, and the prosecutions then occur, and it's much more efficient because they're able to determine which telephones were in the right location at, at the right time. Uh, I remember when I was on, on the board at the Serious Organised Crime Agency, we, we had a, a series of, of um, break-ins that were occurring just off the M1. Uh, and you could actually see from the phone data that somebody was driving down the M1, uh, stopping, uh, going off at a junction, turning their phone off. Uh, a burglary would occur. Uh, and, and 20 minutes later, the phone would be turned on again, and they'd drive on down the motorway, and then they'd, they'd turn their phone off, and, and another burglary would occur around where, they, where the phone had been turned off. It, it wasn't very hard to locate that individual and find quite a lot of stuff under their bed, which um, was, was the basis for the conviction. We didn't need to use the phone records in court. So lots of very good reasons why, why data analysis is important. It, it creates businesses, it creates jobs, 
it creates revenue for the country uh, and it enables uh, governments to operate much more efficiently and therefore to spend less of our money providing the services that, that any developed economy needs. And, and the more people who can use data, potentially the more value that can be extracted from it. And, and the UK government has, has really bought into this. Um, there, there's an open data institute that uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the, the founder of the World Wide Web, and, and Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who's a, a data scientist, and uh, he's, he's now a professor at Jesus College, Oxford. Um, they, they founded the, the Open Data Institute to stimulate the use of open data. And they, they define open data as data that anyone can access, use, and share. And, and it comes with an open data license, because it, if it doesn't come with a license, then it's automatically copyright. So you, you have to have a license that says that people are entitled to use it. And typically in that license, um, what it will actually say is anybody can use this, but, but when you do, say where you got it from. Um, and quite often, in order to stimulate the, the open data movement in the same way as, as the licenses and the open software movement have, have done the same thing, they've said if you incorporate this data into other uh, products or services or, or combine it with other data, you must make that combination of data freely available for everybody to use as well on the same basis. So it, it snowballs. If you look on data.gov.uk, you'll see the databases that the UK government has released under the government open data license. There are more than 22,000 of them. It's a vast amount of data that is available for anybody to use, anybody to inspect, uh, all sorts of things there. Uh, and there's another 10,000 data sets that aren't completely freely available. They're not under the open data license. They've got slightly different licensing conditions. But overall, there's, there's well over 30,000 uh, data sets there. Uh, I, I picked a few out at, at random. And this, uh, the detailed road safety data about, about personal injury road accidents all the way back to 1979, <coughs> including you know, the make and model of the vehicles involved. Um, there's data about planned road works. There's, there's lots and lots of weather data. Um, hourly observations for 150 weather, weather stations and three hourly site-specific forecasts for 5,000 locations over extended periods of time. There's, there's the unclaimed estates held by the uh, Bona Vacantia division. The, these are the, the you know, people who've died and and the money that they've left behind has never been claimed. And, and there's a database of all the un, unclaimed estates. If, if you feel you may have a, a rich relative who... <laughs> that's where to go and look. You, you can look at all the MOT tests and the outcomes, including the, the make and model of the vehicle, the odometer readings and the reasons for failure, going all the way back to, to when MOTs were first computerised in 2005. I was, over 18 million records a year of, of accident and emergency attendance data. These are just a few of the data sets I, I plucked out at, at random just, just to put some up to, to show you. As I say, much more than this, 22,000 freely available data sets. And um, of course, TFL and, and a lot of transport companies make things like bus location data and and route data and ticketing information and so on, freely available. And that's why all the transport apps that we use on our smartphones are available and work. And, and there, there is a company that aggregates that data and then sells it on uh, to people who want to be able to use that transport data from a very wide range of, of sources. There's a reference to that company in the transcript if you want to follow that up should you have an idea for a business you could build on top of that data. Nigel Shadbolt at a, at a meeting uh, just a week ago said, said open data is part of the critical national infrastructure. And you can see why. It, lots of people building services on top of these data sets, these open data data sets. 
But what it means is that each of those data sets is a single point of failure for a growing number of services. And one of the concerns I've got is that nobody has responsibility for, nobody's in a position, nobody could be in a position to know who's using that data. And therefore, what range of services all depend on it? And how many of those are actually being used in critical areas as backups for other ones that depend on it? And, and therefore, we've got a vulnerability of a single point of failure that doesn't have a backup. Um, this, is, this is very similar to the situation with the, the GPS um, timing and positioning signal. Um, you know, a satellite signal that is, is trivially easy to, to jam or to spoof, uh, and yet which vast amounts of services in the country are critically dependent on. And there's a, a reference in the transcript to a report written um, following a study by the Royal Academy of Engineering a, a few years ago that, that lists just who is using the, the GPS data and what kind of vulnerabilities that creates and what sort of effects occur when, when you jam it, as, as the General Lighthouse authorities did in an experiment with MOD um, back, back just a few years ago to see, see what would happen. So ha have a look at the, at the, um, at the GPS report. Uh, as I say, the reference in the transcript. And think about the implications of that sort of common point of failure for some of these other open data sets. It's, it's an interesting issue. The, the dilemma is how, how do you get value out of data whilst you preserve privacy? The UK Data Protection Act um, regulates personal data and, and talks about data which relate to a living individual who can be identified from the data or from those data or, or other data in the possession of the data controller. Um, that's, that's not what the EU directive says. Uh, the EU directive says data controller or any other person. And specifically, uh, it's been clarified by the um, Article 29 Working Party to, to make it clear that it's, it's personal data. If for the time that that data is going to be kept around, somebody could identify the individuals in it, using techniques that they're reasonably likely to have access to. That's very different. Uh, and um, there will be um, the, the general data protection regulation is coming into force in um, May 2018. And that will affect any company that has a presence in the EU uh, and which is processing any personal data for any citizens of the EU. So it will apply to, to most UK companies, whatever happens on June the 23rd, in terms of us being in the EU or, or outside. And um, the, the penalties under that general data protection regulation are pretty draconian if you, if you abuse personal data. It's, it's a revolution in the way that personal data is going to be managed uh, within the EU. And if you look on the Information Commission Officer's website, uh, you'll, you'll see a, a guide on the... 12 things that companies need to be doing to prepare for this. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big issue, and, and perhaps in 2018 we'll come back to that in a, in a Gresham lecture and really go through the detail for people because it's going to be such a big change. Anonymization is unusually difficult. Um, once you've got a data set that contains information about individuals, not aggregated data, not you know, collected data together that with a statistical analysis that says, you know, smokers are 40% more likely to die of lung cancer than anybody else. That sort of data doesn't violate any, any privacy. But if the data is about individuals, you can anonymize it, but it's very difficult to do it right. Because if somebody has access to a few extra details, even if they're imprecise and some of them are wrong, as we'll see in a moment, uh, they can fairly easily uh, re-identify people in supposedly anonymized data. And, and Paul Ohm, who wrote a wonderful paper, he's an American lawyer, uh, wrote, wrote a wonderful paper that I've, I've referenced in the transcript and, and quoted from. Uh, he says, data can either be useful or perfectly anonymous, but never both. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll see why he says that in a minute. 
basically four ways to anonymize. You, you can replace the personal data, you can suppress it, you can generalize it, or you can perturb it. You can introduce noise into the data to make it harder for people to know whether it's true or not. That's part of the basis for a, a technique called differential privacy, which is, is uh, in some very interesting mathematics, but, but too much for, for tonight. It takes surprisingly few details to identify somebody. 61% of the American population in 1990 and 62% in 2000 uniquely identified by their approximate address, that's their five-digit zip code, uh, which I think, I think is a five-digit zip code in America. You know, there are 330 million people in America. I think the zip code, an individual zip code, covers about 7,500 people. <laughs> So with that zip code, you've narrowed it down to 7,500 people, uh, given their gender and their birth date, and you've got them, um, or at least you've got two-thirds of them. That's how little data you need. Some simple maths. Um, 75 billion, uh, 7.5 billion people in the world. Uh, if, you, if you take the log to base 2 of, of 7.5 billion, it's about 32.8. What that means is that you need only 33 bits of information to identify somebody. Um, because there are as many people as you can store in 33 bits that you can number individually in, 32, in a 33-bit a uh, word. And, and there's a, a very interesting website, 33bits.org, named after this phenomenon, which shows how um, you, can, you can regard that 33 bits as the information entropy of uh, data. So, uh, you, and, and each fact that you know about someone re reduces... The entropy, so, so by, by the log to base 2, of, of how common that information is or how uncommon that information is in, in the population that you're interested in. So if you know their gender, because they're you know, taking the simplifying assumption that there are only two genders, log to base 2, that's one bit of information, and, and therefore you can, you can reduce the information in, in entropy by by one bit from 33 bits, if you know their gender. Uh, if you know their star sign, well, there are 12 star signs. So that, that takes about three and a half bits of entropy away, if you know their star sign. Um, if you know their birthday, not, not the year, just the birthday, that's, that's eight and a half bits of data. If you know that they work for the NHS, you know, one and a half million people work for the NHS, so out of the world's population, that, that actually takes... 12 bits of entropy out because it's one in 5,000 people you've narrowed it down to in the world population now. So you can, you can reduce the data entropy. You see the process by which re-identification starts to work by eating away at the entropy in the, in the supposedly anonymous data that you've got. Um, three examples quickly. AOL reduced the anonymized search records of, of 658,000 users over a three-month period to stimulate research into what could be learned from search records. They, they replaced the um, identifying information with, with a unique identifier. Um, so you could still link the, the peoples together. The, uh, so you could tell all the searches carried out by one user, but you didn't know who the user was. Uh, it, it didn't take very long for two journalists to identify user 4417749. Um, she'd searched for people with the last name Arnold. She'd searched for homes sold in Shadow Lake subdivision of Gwinnett County, Georgia, and for pine straw in Lilburn, GA. Um, they tracked her down. She was Thelma Arnold, a widow living in Lilburn in Georgia. And, and they spoke to her, and she said, yes, that's me. I, I, did those, I did those searches. The rest of her searches paint a remarkably detailed and really very poignant, a very sad picture of the life of, of this widow. 
And AOL were really roundly criticised for, for the violation of privacy. They, they claimed it was a screw-up, that they didn't know that, that somebody was going to do this in their company, that if they had, they'd have stopped it. They took the data down, but of course it was too late. The internet never forgets. Always worth remembering, the internet never forgets. Several mirror sites had already been set up. There's one. Um, notsecret.com. And, and you... Let's go back. You can click on a, a random user uh, and see everything that they search for. You can click on, on the search terms and see everybody else who searched for that search term, or, or you can type in a search term and find everybody who, who searched on that and then click on, on their uh, individual user number and find everything else that the, the person who searched for that also searched for. Um, very privacy intrusive. Huge fun, of course. <laughs> Um, this is the, the description, um, the about us description of, of this, this website explaining you know, why they have done it and, and warning you, you know, please be cautious about, about searching this stuff at work because quite a lot of the, uh, the data searches, as you might expect, are not safe for work. Um, here's one. <laughs> Other users search this, I mean, they, one, one user appeared to be, be contemplating wife swapping. Um, you can repeat these. You know, I mean, the, the, I've, I've given you enough, enough information to be able, able to go back and verify that I, you know, I haven't made these up. This, this data is there and you can look at it and you'll find lots more like that if you go looking. When you use a search engine, assume that your IP address and all your search terms, and probably a lot more about you, are being retained by the people using the search engine, by, by the search engine company. I mean, Google, uh, in, in its various uh, run-ins with the European Union, uh, has told the EU that it anonymises IP addresses after nine months by taking the, the last three digits of, and, and uh, removing them from the IP address. That's still very, very revealing data, though. And, and it's only after nine months. If, if you feel that you don't want Google to have this information about you, don't use Google. Use Start Page. Um, this is from the About Us on, on Start Page. They don't keep IP addresses. They don't keep any information about the searches. They run the searches through Google, so you get the same information back as you would if you searched from Google, but... But all Google knows is that start pages run those searches, and they can't correlate them between, between different searches. Um, so it, it gives you a lot, more, a lot more privacy. Second example, Netflix. Net Netflix, you, you all know what Netflix does. They launched a, a big prize for, for improvements to its algorithm for, for taking data about what pictures people had enjoyed and rated highly, and recommending other pictures to them that they might, they might want to rate. Um, participants, in order to, to compete, were given access to a training data set, 100 million ratings from um, 480,000 randomly chosen customers. How, how much information? And that's all you get. Um, just the ratings, the movie titles and the ratings. How much information would it take to be able to identify a user and get access to their entire movie viewing and ratings out of that data set. Not much. It took um, these two researchers two weeks to announce that they could identify a high proportion of the subscribers in the training data set. And interestingly, they did it theoretically. They simply used probability theory. If you know a few random ratings and the corresponding dates for some subscriber, the kind of, it doesn't even have to be accurate dates. You know, you, you can assume that if you're talking to somebody at work uh, about uh, a movie that they've watched um, and, and they say it's terrific, then if they're using Netflix, they will have rated it highly on Netflix and probably on the Internet Movie Database as well. Uh, and they've probably watched it within the last two or three days. That's enough. 
You get that for, for a small number of, of movies and you've got their whole history out of that data set. With eight movie rate, ratings, two of which can be completely wrong, and dates that may have a three-day error, 96% of the Netflix subs subscribers in that trading data set could be, could be uh, identified. And they could work that out just by doing a probabilistic analysis. All the, I've, I've given the reference to the paper. It's only 10 pages long. You can see how they did it. It was a surprising result, and it's kicked off a, a big amount of research work in the area of, of re-identification. 64% of subscribers, you only need two ratings and dates. And, and for 89%, two ratings are enough to reduce the set of records to eight records out of, out of the, the nearly 500,000 records. And of course, you can then look at those eight records and, and add in any additional information you've got to, to de-anonymize. Why is that important? It's only movies. Well... Yes, it's only movies. Um, they did it theoretically, and by the way, they then tested it, used it on the assumption that people would rate the same movies highly on the Internet Movie Database, and that's freely available. It's open data. Um, uh, they, they just went looking. They, they took just a sample of, of 500 users out of that and, and ran that against the Netflix data set and demonstrated that, in fact, there was enough data in the Internet Movie Database to identify the viewing histories in the Netflix data and therefore validate their mathematics. But, but more interestingly, a small number of Facebook likes can be used to automatically predict a lot of information about you. Facebook likes, highly rated movies will do the same, the same trick. This is, this is data mining, machine learning, high, high degrees of correlation. This is not gay people saying, I like this gay movie. This is, this is people saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in a number of things that appear to be completely unconnected with any protected characteristic, any personal characteristic. And yet, as, as the paper shows, the, the uh, Cambridge paper shows, you can get sexual orientation, ethnicity, religious and political views, Intelligence, happiness, use of drugs, whether your parents have separated, how old you are, your gender. Out of a very small number of these things, with a pretty high degree of confidence. Not certainty, but with a pretty high degree of confidence. Third example. Um, Massachusetts decided they were going to anonymise a bunch of medical records and release them. Um, the, uh, the governor... Um, got a, a storm of don't do that from, uh, from the uh, computer science community. And he said, no, no, it's, all, it's going to be all right. It's all anonymous. Uh, Latiana Sweeney, director of the Data Privacy Lab at Carnegie Mellon, who's the person who, who came up with that statistic I showed you earlier about, about how many Americans you can identify from their zip code and, and, and birth date and so on. Um, she immediately obtained the data and, and compared it against the public voter registration records. And, and one case stood out. It was the governor. Um, his, his data, his medical records were in the set that had been, been released. Um, six people had his birth date. Only three of them were men, and he was the only one in his five-digit zip code. Uh, so within a small number of days of the data coming out, she sent the, uh, his medical records, including uh, all his diagnoses and medication, to his office. Uh, <laughs> theatrical flourish. Um, I won't bother to, to, to go through that. This is, this is just a, a quick analysis to show that, that actually a, a UK postcode is a, is a bit like a, an American zip code. The, you, you get 7,500 people per zip code. If you partly anonymise a UK postcode, you're down to about, about 3,000 addresses. So it's roughly the same as a, as a zip code. So you know, don't imagine that that level of anonymisation uh, is doing a lot for, for making data anonymous. And yet that's the kind of thing people, people do with medical records. What they're doing, you see... Is, is doing a simple join on two data sets. 
you know, you've got medical records, you've got voter records, they both contain the gender, the date of birth, and the zip code. And by simply running a database join operation, you can correlate the two, the two databases and pick out the records that are common. Now, this is, this is a trivial um, piece of, of database analysis. You can do much more sophisticated stuff than this, obviously. But it shows the power, and it shows how you can do it automatically. So a lot of the things that we thought were anonymized aren't really anonymous. And when, when Alfred Kinsey was doing his, his famous um, human sexuality studies back in the 1930s, he went to a lot of trouble to anonymize the, the identities of the participants in, in those studies um, before he, he published any of the data. Um, something like three quarters of those people have now been identified, despite the work that he did to try to make sure that was impossible. So, what have I said? Privacy is a legal right, and it matters. It matters to, to all of us a bit, to some of us an enormous amount, and you don't know which of those categories you're going to be in next year, or in a decade's time, or a member of your family is going to be in next year or a decade's time. And data is persistent. So your privacy matters to you more than you probably realise. Circumstances change. Governments change, social attitudes change. People move to other countries which have different cultural norms, which have different laws, where entirely legal things that they, they have done may be regarded very badly in their new community. There are lots of reasons why historic information about you and your families is, is actually a, a ticking time bomb at some level because it may come back and be used in a way that you didn't expect. If, if a future government were to start charging um, for healthcare because healthcare had to be rationed and decided that people with certain lifestyles needed to pay for their healthcare because they clearly hadn't looked after themselves, the, the purchase data on your Tesco club card might be used against you. I'm, I'm a fanciful example, but you, you get the point. These sorts of historic data trails can affect quite a lot. And, and as we shall see on, on the 18th of October, they're already being used to affect, um, for example, what news you, you see. Um, they're, they're being used to affect what advertisements you get shown and what prices you pay for things that you buy online. And so there are issues here which, as, as citizens of this cyber-enabled world, we need to understand so that we can engage with it, so that we can decide what defences we want to use and, and what democratic means we want to use to influence the regulations. And one of the reasons why I believe strongly we need to remain in Europe is that much of, of the decisions that need to be taken are going to be controlling the way in which large companies use the vast amount of data that they collect. And no individual country can have that power. It has to be done by, by a market at least as big as the EU um, to be able to, to flex muscles well enough to be able to impose a political will on, on a, a major uh, organisation. So there, there are big issues here that, that we need to understand and, and to engage with. When, when you release data about individuals, those individuals can often be re-identified. It, it's very difficult. If you're in the business of releasing data about individuals, or even of holding personal data, then you've got a responsibility to protect that data, a legal duty to protect that data, which means certainly at rest and in transmission, it ought to be encrypted. At the moment, in general, you can't keep it encrypted while you're processing it, um, although you know, there's, there's advances in what's called homomorphic encryption, which are, are helping us to move down, down that, that way. 
down that path so that that, that will gradually become possible. But it, it takes vast amounts of computing power to be able to, to do that at the moment. It's just not, not practical in, in many application areas. But, but in general, protecting the data by, by encrypting it is, is great because then you know, if your website gets hacked, um, people aren't going to, going to get anything that they can use as long as you've done the encryption right. Don't, don't write your own. Everybody gets it wrong. We might come back to that in a future lecture. Um, but it's, it's things like medical records where you want to be able to release data for research purposes and at the same time you need to be able to protect privacy. That's where the dilemma really occurs. And, and re-identification is becoming easier. The definition of personally identifiable information is right at the heart of the laws and the regulations that, that all the regulators and, and, and uh, companies and law firms use for, for uh, managing the privacy of, of data. It's probably the wrong way to regulate the privacy of personal data now. There is a growing view that, that focusing on what we mean by personally identifiable data is just the wrong approach. Uh, I was at a meeting recently where, where Baroness uh, Honora O'Neill, the, the ethicist, was speaking, and, and she, she believes that we ought to be moving to regulating what processing people are allowed to do with personal data, not what, what personal data they're allowed to have. Uh, but there's some major discussions that are going to be needed before we can, can get ourselves into a position where we can change the, the vast number of laws and regulations that are actually working in this area but have been undermined completely by the advancing science of re-identification of supposedly anonymised data. So my conclusion is that, that Paul Ohm is right. At the moment, data can either be useful or perfectly anonymous, but it can't be both. If you take out the information that would enable you to re-identify individuals in, in a data set of individuals' data, uh, then it probably isn't going to be much use anymore because you would have taken out so much that you can't do any useful processing with it. We need to find a different approach to regulating this area because on the one hand the data is really valuable and we need to be able to get that, that value out of the data. On the other hand, privacy is too important for us to give it up. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>